The first sponsorship on Warden's Watch is Trail Runner Wireless Internet, available in Coas County and Washington County, Maine. High-speed internet for rural areas. And they're the company I work for other than podcasting, so and I, I thank you for their support. Uh, this is high-speed internet r- rural areas, making my podcast happen and making businesses happen in remote places, as well as bringing technology to you folks when you live out in the country. Please go to MyTrailRunner.com and like the page on Facebook as well. That would help them a lot and help me to continue Warden's Watch. <laughs> GuideFitter.com. GuideFitter, bridging you to the outdoors while providing a quality platform for guides and outfitters for you to select from. GuideFitter is the best place to get discounts on gear if you're an outdoor professional. As a game warden, I'm a member of the Outdoor Government Program, which has over 80 quality brands to get discounts from. It's free to join. Yes, free to join. And all you need to do is prove that you're an active outdoor government employee. There are all kinds of products available. Apparel, boots, archery equipment, optics, backpacks, cameras, watches, ammo, anything, you name it. And while you're there, check out the articles, information, and stories that you'll be inspired from. So before you head out to work in the outdoors or start your next outdoor adventure, check out GuideFitter.com and get discounts on your everyday or every so often outdoor equipment. This is Game Warden Wayne Saunders for GuideFitter. RodGeeks.com. RodGeeks is a company that designs and builds fishing rods. They are a partner with St. Croix Rods and have been building fishing rods since 2008. They use St. Croix's expertise in all their rod designs so you can trust the rods. The RG42 is a one-piece travel rod. performs like a much longer rod but is compact enough to keep anywhere so you can fish anytime. They offer it as a kit that includes rod, reel, fishing line, case, pliers, and a tackle tray. Put your favorite baits in the tray and you have everything you need to go fishing. It may look unconventional, but this rod really works. Pick up an RG42 kit today and you won't regret it. Please join me, Game Warden Wayne Saunders, and other Game Wardens on our adventures protecting wildlife, saving lives, and having fun, all while serving the public and the natural resources of our planet. Listen to the tales and experience of those who work in the outdoors while being entertained with stories about encounters with poachers, wildlife investigation, murder investigation, near-death experiences, search and rescue missions, wildlife interactions from game wardens around the country and around the world. When I retired, I realized I couldn't let go of that legacy, but rather wanted to share the passion commitment and the stories of those men and women that call themselves game wardens this is game warden wayne saunders and this is warden's watch i'm hanging out with eric hannett who i haven't hung out with in probably 16 years hi eric it's been about that yeah yeah so and that's because he was a trainee and actually trained with me so I don't know what I'm going to do when I don't know a guy that I interview because that's, you know, I always have some inside, some knowledge, some, some story. Uh, and when, when I go to somebody I don't know, it's going to be, it's going to be difficult. I'll say that. So uh, transitioning to, to trying to pry things out of people. It'll be different. That's yeah. for sure. Not yeah. having that contact. And, and, right. You know, um, I don't have to pry knowledge. things out of you. I know things that you don't want to tell people that I can reveal. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. You got firsthand knowledge. Right. That you were almost a vegetarian. That's right. <laughs> almost <laughs> so eric was uh ha- was a trainee with me in the winter time so uh, uh we get to ride snowmobiles because that's what wardens in northern new hampshire generally do in the winter time so we ride all the snowmobiles and we used to ride a lot back then and we were basically troopers on snowmobiles wouldn't you agree yeah it's, it's a pretty apt description and you had a pretty sweet sled if i remember correctly yeah it was a 700 yeah it was like the only 700 we had the only 700 and it was a really good sled so and then you blew it up <laughs> that was your fault <laughs> I, don't, I still don't understand why it was my fault just because i said we would try to get to this road yeah yeah uh, so we yeah. can get it out you, i was try. i was gonna say let's let's get some add some coolant to it to it and not take any chances you said that'll ah, be fine yeah it'll be fine i did yeah so i'm gonna so blame you we almost made it to the road then you blew up to 700 then i had to explain why you blew up to 700 and then i had to take the whole fault on that so i had to do the report though i think Yes, you did. No doubt. But, uh, you know, I will say when your equipment starts to fail, you should really stop and take a look and do an evaluation on it prior to blowing it up. Yeah. It was a valuable lesson learned. It I was think. a valuable lesson for, for, both, me, of for us, both of us. You know, it was, it was a good training opportunity for you. Absolutely. That's I probably created that That's just for it. that Absolutely. incident. So, you know, the, the wintertime, though, we get to do is check fishermen, that type of thing. Yeah. 
So, um, and then, uh, you know, training year, you're done. Boom. Yep. Went quick, huh? Um, yeah, yes and no. I mean, it was quick in a lot of ways, but in a lot of ways it was a long, it it felt like it was a long time because it was just, I, you know, I was, I had a young family at the time. Mm -hmm. Um, I was away a lot. Um, it was difficult. Um, you know, it was one of those things. You weren't like a spring chicken or anything when you came on. Yeah. I mean, yeah. So to speak, sorry. Right. Right. I mean, I'd I'd, had had four years on the job and, and, um, not like and, you were old or anything. No, no, and but I mean, just, I, I had some experience, I right. guess. You, know, you didn't so. come out green out of college right. and, you know. Right. And, so. I, and, and I think the biggest thing was for me was just having a family at home versus, a, a, you know, a, a guy fresh out of college oh, that didn't have Someone has roots compared to someone right. who doesn't. Exactly. Yeah, no, it became a lot more difficult, I'm sure, because I didn't have any roots and it didn't phase me. So I wonder if I had any roots when we were working together. <laughs> Took me a while to spring roots. Yeah, no, you did. Yeah, I think you, yeah. You did. So. You no no children or anything, but yeah, yeah. you were married at the time. So, no, well, that's good. So, yeah. so I'm a new sergeant, and uh, it's a search and rescue mission, and uh, it's the second day of the search and rescue mission, and I see this uh, game warden limping towards the vehicles being used to shuttle people up to the top of the mountain, and uh, I look, and it's a uh, conservation officer Eric Hannett, who happens to be probably one of the most physical fit uh, game wardens that we have. In, in the outfit, and I'm like, Eric, what's wrong? Remember that, Eric? Yeah, I re- remember it very clearly. Yeah, and uh, Eric had busted his hump the day before, and um, yeah, got hurt. So, and was getting ready to go up the mountain again. When uh, and I said, did you let anybody know that you were hurt? And you did, huh? Uh, yeah, I I'd, I'd, I'd let somebody know that that um that I was injured. Um, yeah. And me being a new sergeant, I stuck my nose right in it because uh, I didn't want you going up there hurt. So, uh, and I think that was a, that was a whole different uh, thought process back then. It was like wear us out till we're done, huh? Yeah, so. I, th- I think so. I mean, I think that, like I said, I was I was injured and I, I would have continued, but I know uh, I was, but I was a liability, worse than right? That, exactly. Absolutely. And I I think I pointed that out, and uh, <laughs> you know, and uh, you got sent home because of it. So, which was a, I think a good good process, but I think. It was a time for a change, so to speak, and I think when we started off, Eric, it was, uh, you know, we had to go and go and go. So and uh, and and that's one thing people don't understand. You know, there's nobody to replace us. Wardens, we're we're there, and we're we're the only ones there, and we keep going and going and going. Uh, you told me about, uh, you know, we were talking earlier today about uh, the what 36 hour stint that you did. Uh, yeah, yeah, that was a, that was a long. Um you know, long during the hunting season, along 36 hours, it was 36 to 40 hours of just kind of going and going just because nobody else is, nobody else is going to do it. We're, we're the ones that have to get the job done and, and there's not, and every it's time not you shift work. Home, it's, it's, yeah. You think you got another call. Right. Absolutely. It just, it wouldn't stop. It was just one thing after the next, but you know, you just got to get it done. Yeah. And the one thing that I, I thought was really cool about when you talked about that is you had a trainee and you guys kind of bonded during that 36 hour, uh, you know, extender. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It, we we uh, brought us pretty close together. We were yeah. kind of both. Deal, you know, when misery loves company, and and certainly we were both miserable, and uh, we gave each other some company. So we we we. I feel like we became pretty good friends as a result of it. Yeah. And you get that slap happy, overtired. Yes. Jovial talking and uh, pretty much bonding time, which uh, uh, that's pretty cool. So, um, so it's good. It's good to work long hours and hard and. Uh, you know, that, that's what I always worried about me with search and rescue missions is uh, we're burning out people because it, it's we can do that because there's nobody to replace and we just keep going and going. And day three, you know, with using the same people, it's just it's it's we're on the brink of almost breaking. Oh, for sure. And I think you, you start to be get uh, not as, as vigilant and as, and as careful and as, as, you know, as observant as you could be or should be after, you know, three days. But again, you got to do it. You got to do what you got to do. Uh, absolutely. And you always had that mentality because you've always been that, you've always done physical fitness training, haven't you? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Oh, it's, it's always been an important part of my life. Yeah. So when I saw Eric Hannett, the guy that's most physically fit in the department limping, I was like, what the heck, you know? So well, I knew you weren't faking. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. No, no faking here. <laughs> so how many years you on, Eric? I'm going on 16. This is, I'm in, I'm in my 16th year right now. So yeah, as a conservation officer, you still had a, a prior life a prior career didn't you 
Yeah, um, I worked for four years as a police officer. So, um, Did yeah, that so, help you with your being a game warden? Uh, so very much. Yeah, I mean, being a being a police officer, I think, is before being a game warden, it's it, it was a huge, huge help, and just you know, especially working in a town where it was busy. Uh, we arrested a lot of people. It was, um, you know, it was just there was a lot of activity and a lot of experience that I gained from that that I wouldn't have been able to get any other way. So absolutely, it's it's. I wish more. I wish more guys could spend more time just doing regular police work to kind of get a feel for for that side of the of of what we do in law enforcement. You get the fundamentals of law enforcement, the nuts and the bolts. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Which would sometimes game wardens don't get because we're focused on game laws more so than criminal laws. Yeah, yeah absolutely. I mean, I think it's it's um, you know, we that's primarily what we do as as conservation officers is is the fishing game part of it and we kind of forget the some of the fundamentals that and you know and ultimately it sometimes it doesn't work you know the 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 stuff that you do as a cop you know officer safety type stuff we can't really get away with doing as as a conservation officer because we have to be up close and personal with people right. um and i think but but it's something that's always and in they my always mind always have guns usually always have guns or always armed um mm-hmm. you know we wouldn't survive if we every guy that we saw had a gun we we you know we kind of took the typical you know dropped the gun and, and took a uh, you know a hard stance on it because most of the people that we deal with have guns and you, you, that's a little hard to get used to but Absolutely. once you get used to it, it kind of becomes second nature i guess and I know when I've had police officers ride with me, they say the same thing. How do you deal with that? You know, you see a guy with a gun all the time. I'm like, you get used to it, whether that's good or bad. Yep. I don't, I don't know. You know, but we we do get used to seeing guns, yep. and they absolutely become part of our every day. Absolutely. So, but I, I I would agree because the fundamentals of writing those warrants and that type of thing, you know, as a police officer, you do a lot of that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So, and you make a lot of arrests. Yep. Search a lot of people, especially you had a college town you started in. Correct. Yeah. So custodial arrest was huge. We did all that all the time, and we were constantly arresting people. And that, you know, it's something that's like falling off a bike. You just never forget, you know, how to do it. So um, it's it's something that, like I said, I, I wish that our guys could do more of that. Could work in a town where where you could just you know spend a month or spend two months just arresting people and foot pursuits and you know fighting with people it's it's something that you you can't you can't learn that from a book um and you know you once you once you have it as a it's something that you'll always have with you'll never forget yeah no i think you're right that's good fundamentals so so 16 years as a conservation officer and you work in what area of new hampshire i cover the keen patrol so the southwestern corner of the state it's a pretty rural patrol, isn't it? Yeah, it's uh, it's becoming a little less rural. It's starting to get a little more developed, um, but there's still uh, a little bit of everything. It's it's kind of what I've liked about that area from the beginning. It's it's uh, it's got you know hunting, fishing. It's got search and res- rescue activity. A you know ATV, OHRV stuff. So it's got a little bit of everything, but not a lot of one particular thing. Which you know, with my adult ADD, kind of helps because I get bored real quick. So yeah. Um, it's yeah, just that's as a soon nice thing. As, it yeah. changes all the time. Yeah, I, I don't, you know, I couldn't deal with the same thing all the time, day in, day out. So yeah. it's always changing. Do you have moose down in that keen country? Yeah, yeah, it's our, our moose population. I think is, is you know, and I might be wrong, but it seems like it's doing better than up north because we're not really affected by the winter ticks and stuff down there. So, right. um, you know, brainworm was a thing a while back where we were getting a lot of them with brainworm, but I think cars kill more moose down our way than anything. Um, mm. But are, they're they're healthy. They're doing well. Yeah, ever any problems with any incidents, any stories about moose? Yeah, yeah, there's been a few over the years. Um, it, it's it's slowed down over the last couple of years as far as, you know, the real problems. Like I said, brainworm years ago was a, a big problem. But, yeah, there was, there was a time when I was um, when I was chased by a moose, and I think I'm pretty, sh- I'm pretty sure he was going to kill me. Um, yeah. No, he didn't catch me, fortunately. <laughs> um, you are a pretty fast uh, guy. I was yeah. pretty, pretty yeah. agile, yeah. 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 So, uh, so what, he, what happened? Well, long story short, he um, he'd been hit by a car. He had his his back leg was injured, um, and it'd been it had been like a week roughly where I was getting calls on him. Then when he was hit by the car, he obviously didn't die. Injured back leg was getting calls on him for about a week straight, where he would be in one spot, and I'd go try to find him, and he'd be gone, and and I'd, you know I'd, I'd leave, and the next day or that afternoon I'd get another call about him. So this went on for like six or seven days. So finally, after about day seven, I get a call. He's hanging out over in the spot, and I said, "All right, I'm done dealing with this. So I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go figure this it's thing a out." Big bull, or yeah, big bull. Yep, yep, big bull. Obviously injured. He's been hanging out, not moving real fast. So I go over to a, to where I, I was told that he was last seen. I, I I get out of my truck. I start walking around trying to beat the bush, and very quickly I see what I see an antler, and I see a hoof sticking up 
out of, out of the ground, off out of the tall grass. And I'm like, what? The heck? thing must be dead, right? It must be laying there stiff and it's, its antlers sticking up and its legs sticking up. So I get probably about 20 feet from it and it stands up. So clearly he's not dead. So I'm trying to figure out what to do. I'm very close to downtown Keene. So I'm trying to figure out what I'm going to do with this thing. So I, I, as I'm trying to figure it out, the thing takes off towards the center of Keene. It's like headed right towards downtown Keene. So I start running kind of to try to cut it off and try to try to um, get it away from town and push it out, outside of town. So he's running one way, I'm running the other way, and, and we're kind of running parallel with each other. And we get it around into where these houses are. And um, his houses, I mean, we're in a, a bona fide neighborhood here. So he, him and I come around the, either side of the house and we meet kind of head on. And was, we're probably 20-ish feet apart. <laughs> So I'm thinking, all right, I'm gonna I'm gonna make some noise and kind of push him and, and get him back wave to where he arms, came. Wave my arms, back. clap my hands, yep. you know, just kind of scare him back. Well, I I start clapping at him. I start saying, "Hey, I'm here, Moose, you know, come on, get going." And and uh, he turns and he runs towards me. He is running. He's he. I mean, for an injured moose, he was very very quick. Yes. And so fortunately, I had a hemlock tree. I've been there. I understand. <laughs> yes. Fortunately, I had a hemlock tree in front of me, and I kind of just backed up with this hemlock, hemlock tree. It was about four inches in diameter. Not real big. No, but not real big. <laughs> big enough to hopefully save me. Yeah, and, not uh, big enough when you get a bull moose coming at you. Yeah, exactly. It seemed like it was about an inch thick at the time. And so I just kind of kept that in line with me, and I pulled, I drew my, I drew my pistol out because I was going to shoot him if I had to, but mm-hmm. I didn't want to because there's a lot of houses everywhere. And so he hit that hemlock tree like full, full tilt. He hit as hard as he, I don't think he saw it. I think it was just dead in front of him, and he didn't see it. And so that stopped him in his tracks, and um, and then he kind of turned tail and started walking the other way. That was kind of my warning. He said he said he won that little little battle. So, like an idiot, I I, uh, I said, well, I'll try it again, and I I clapped at him a few times, and he looked at me, and his ears went back. I said, all right, all right, I'll I'll, I'll give you the I'll give you the benefit of doubt on this one. So, my plan was to go back to my truck and 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 kind of reassess and get my shotgun because yeah, it made it a little more appropriate for moose. So, yeah, that's that's one yeah. thing we have to kill a lot of animals, whether we like it or not. Yep, we so, do. No, it's called the game warden when there's an animal problem, and half the time it's sick or injured, and that's why we got to deal with them. So, yep, yeah, no doubt. But that that that's a good moose story. Yeah, I, it was. Uh, I, I'm glad I'm here telling it to you yeah, today, and not yeah. uh, on the other side Could of the stick. Near, on that near one. death experience <laughs> via moose. It so. was close. Yeah, would have been a heck of a thing on your headstone there to say, you know, killed by a moose. Or, yep. Yep. Yeah. So, well, that, that that's a pretty good story. Any other wildlife stories that come to your mind? Um, Turkey well, cases. Yeah, I mean, yeah. There's, I mean, there's certainly as far as cases go. I mean, wildlife. I mean, I didn't. We didn't talk about the alligator case or the alligator story. That was a pretty good one. Yeah, let's hear it. Um, well, so this was You're years an alligator country, and huh? years. Yeah, alligator country. I've actually yeah. dealt with two alligators, believe it or not. <laughs> um, so years and years ago, I got a call from the Vermont warden, and uh, he was saying something about uh, somebody had caught an alligator, and it was over in in, in Vermont. And they uh, caught it in the Connecticut River? They caught it in the Connecticut River. So I'm like, there's no way. There's no way there's an, this is an alligator in the Connecticut River. So I call the guy up and he's like, yeah, I got I got an alligator. I'm over here in Vermont and it's um, I got it in a box and it's and it's in the garage. And I'm like, all right, sure. I'm, all right. Well, I'll, I'm, I'll bite. You know, I'll come pick, come take a look at it tomorrow. And if it's an alligator, I'll take it. I'm thinking it's probably an, igu- an iguana or something like that, you know. So I get over there and uh guy brings me into his garage and sure as day it's a four foot American alligator. And I'm Man. like, Are you kidding me? So he said, Oh yeah, it's real friendly. It must be someone's pet because we've been we've been uh, we've been handling it, we've been passing around, we've been taking pictures and stuff. Great. I said, oh, all right. Well I said, Tell you what, I'll you I'll go get my camera and you uh you hold on to the alligator and I'll take your picture because we had a we had a spot on the wall in the office in Keene that you know, pictures people with, with wildlife. So he goes, All right, so I go get my camera and I he I come back and He's standing there, and he's got kind of a funny look on his face. And I said, all right, we'll grab the alligator, we'll take a picture. And he goes, no, no, I'm not picking it up. I said, what do you mean? He said, I went to pick it up, and that thing turned and snapped at me. And uh, <laughs> it wasn't having that. So I think what happened was it was really cold when they were handling uh, it. And I think it was very docile, and it was just, it was just you know, real cold. And I think it spent the night in the, in the garage, gotcha. and it warmed, warmed up. up. And now it, was, now, it was, now it wasn't so friendly. It wasn't so friendly. Yeah. yeah. So uh, That's great. So needless to say, we kept it in the box for as long as we could. And, <laughs> well, and, at least he uh, didn't come back, and he was missing three fingers. Yeah, that's true. Or something. Could have been, could have been worse. <laughs> but it would have been in Vermont, so I it would have been in Vermont. Wouldn't have been yeah. my problem. <laughs> yeah, grab that alligator, sir, and I'll take a picture of you with it. Yes, yep. <laughs> yes. That was a good one. Oh, certainly have had some interesting things. So, uh, search and rescue missions. Um, you know, some of those things are dangerous, especially when you're driving your trucks and stuff like that. And <laughs> yeah. you know, 
Uh, you know, I, it's sad. I'm privy to some of these stories, so that's, I'm trying to draw these out of you because uh, so there's some of the best uh, the Eric Hannett stories that I <laughs> I know, and uh, you know that, that's what I want to do. And uh, you know, certainly uh, you got a heck of a story about a rescue and driving trucks down icy roads, huh? Yeah, I do. <laughs> like a near death experience. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, for, for some, for, for, not for, for some. some. Yeah, not for yeah. you, maybe. I but. mean, yeah. It, it, I mean, it could have, it kind of gone a lot. It could have gone a lot worse. It yes. was, uh, it was one of those scenarios where, um, had it been a couple more feet one direction, it, it could have been mm. really, really bad. Um, but yeah. So, so Bill Boudreaux and I, we, well, we had a, we had a search on Mount, or on, uh, on in Pisgah State Park, and uh, the beginning of the search, it was not snowing, or it just started snowing. And uh, so I drove up to the top of one of the, the mountain, the, the access road mountains, and I was on my PA system. I was trying to yell to the to the, to the person on the PA or, or talk on the PA loud enough so they could hear me. So I used that all the way up um, to get up to the top of the mountain. And I, I think it started snowing, at the, you know, at the beginning of that. So I offloaded my truck. I'm sorry. I parked my truck and I offloaded my ATV um, at the top of the mountain just because I figured that's where we we're going to start from riding ATVs to go search further. Um, so I figured I'd just leave my truck there. So we, I offloaded my ATV and I rode through the park, got to the other side of the, the trail system basically. And, uh, and we'd, we'd located the girl. We'd found her, um, Bill Boudreaux and who's a trainee at the time actually. And so he was uh, a trainee and now he's your lieutenant, huh? Now he's my lieutenant. Yeah. Right. And, uh, <laughs> How's that work out? So yeah, good, good for me. It's a good job for him, not for me. Um, but so he was with Craig Morocco, uh, the lieutenant at the time, and so we found the girl. Everything was good. She was she was all all good to go, not injured. Um, and so he brought me back to my trucks because um, I was on the other side. I loaded my ATV into his truck. He drove me back to where my truck was. Now it had been snowing the entire time, and it was snowing pretty heavy. So we'd accumulated probably three inches of snow, four inches of snow over that that time period. And uh, so he drove me all the way up to the top to where my truck was. I loaded it onto my, or loaded my ATV onto my truck, and then we started driving down the mountain, basically. And it was, it's pretty steep. It's an access road, but it's, it's pretty steep. So we, on the way down, we started kind of, it was pretty good, pretty controlled. You know, it was, it was you know, breaking and kind of starting to fishtail. Well, it started getting real, real steep. And, uh, and then there's a big 90 degree turn at this one spot, and it was like, starting to build up speed couldn't if i hit the brakes i'd start to fishtail i'd have to let off the brakes it, it was getting where it, it wasn't good so i tried cutting it through the corner of this like this 90 degree turn and it, i wasn't making it so i went right through the, the turn smashed into a tree and again I, like i said if i'd been if i had not hit the tree and gone four feet to the left i would have gone down over a really steep bank and and probably got seriously hurt mm. well i crashed into the tree and i look up just in time to see bill boudreau coming in starsky and hutch style sideways down this thing and he rolled his truck over he hit a berm and like rolled the truck completely over and so um he was like i said he was a trainee at the time so i'm like holy smokes this is not good so bill all the dust kind of settles bill pops his head up out of the driver's side door and says oh well, i'm fired <laughs> so, <laughs> he was a little worried about being you know he's a trainee he's a little concerned about understandable being fired. Uh, very understandable yeah just totaled the truck rolled it Lo- total the truck rolled it so long story short with that when we ended up right siding his truck we got it back upon its you know four wheels dusted it off the, it was good dusted as new, it all huh? off yeah it was good as new <laughs> um the he had a milk crate that was inside his truck in the back seat and it had all of his books and stuff in the in the milk crate. Well, somehow that milk crate, when he flipped that truck, had gone past his head, broke out the past, the driver's side window and ended up under the front fender of this truck. Jeez. I have no idea how that happened. I don't... Without it, hitting his head. Without hitting him in the head and killing him. Yeah. And the thing weighed probably... 25 pounds with all full of books yeah and somehow it i don't know how it happened i don't know how it got out of the, the you know the truck that fast period but how it managed to get by his his big noggin without hitting him in the head is beyond me yeah it was crazy that is so crazy. He's, he's lucky he didn't get killed i mean we're yeah. both pretty lucky i guess yeah no doubt but uh yeah and those things happen for sure putting ourselves out there when nobody else is and uh you know under those conditions you know so for sure but um you know, just looking back, uh, you know, you certainly have had an active fishing game um, history there, and I always like seeing the picture we put in an Operation Game Thief uh, calendar one year with you and uh, all the fish that they caught in the Connecticut River. So um, that was uh, qu- quite a feat that you guys did down there. Um, you had some help there from the feds, too, and chicken. Can you, can you talk about that? Because uh, to me, that's pretty cool. 
thing to do in your career anyways to do an operation like that, especially with a name. I never had an operation with a name, man. Yeah, uh, Operation Panfish Plunder was what the feds gave it for a name. So that, yeah. I mean, that, that was pretty good. Yeah, it's um, catchy. Yeah, they, the original name was Operation Ice Holes, but for whatever reason, they, they chose not to go with that they one. They didn't which, like Ice Holes, huh? Yeah, I, I, I thought it was catchy. but Yeah, ice fishing. So, so yeah, I mean, that was a great um, case or a great example of you know, multiple agency cooperation. Um, you know, it seems as though, you know, in my experience with all the different agencies, you know, whether it's state, federal, um, we all seem to cooperate very well. I mean, we get along. I, I think that our, our agency gets along with all the other law enforcement agencies agree. out there. Um, but when it comes, certainly when it comes to, to protecting the resources, I think we're willing to, to, to look beyond anything like I don't it doesn't matter to me what who's who's in charge here who's claiming to be the boss or whatever I, I don't care as long, as, long as, as you get, get the, the job, job done, done. exactly yeah. um, and so ultimately what we were having was or what I had was I had a lot of reports of um, and, I, and it ended up being that you know I, I found this to be true but there's not a lot I could do about it at the time but we we're getting a lot of people that were commercial fishing down um, down in, in Hinsdale on the Connecticut River and they and, were doing this through the ice during the winter correct right? yes they were they were ice fishing um, and they were ultimately taking these fish um, back to New York where it's I, I, I believe to this day it's still legal to sell freshwater fish in the state of New York there's some terms and, and some conditions that they have to follow but you can still sell freshwater fish um, in the state of New York hmm. but you can't catch them in the state of New Hampshire and bring them to New York and sell them um, and so what these guys were doing is they were coming down in the winter time through the ice ice fishing catching these fish and they were pretty smart about it because they wouldn't they wouldn't have over limits with them they're you're allowed to have a certain amount of fish and they would make sure that they didn't have an over limit they would they would they would catch their limit they would leave and then they would go somewhere else and and um fish, and fish. they'd hide the those fish and and they they'd go somewhere else and fish somewhere else in the river and at you know at the beginning of it there wasn't a whole lot I could do because they didn't have over limits i i would watch mm -hmm. them and you know, i could only follow them so far they would go over into vermont and right. um and then come back into new hampshire so i i fortunately it was Right around the time of one of our block trainings, which is you know our training that we do with with all of our department members, and one of the federal guys, the federal U.S. Fish and Wildlife guys, had had come to the training, and so I met him at the training. And he was new, and he was kind of telling me, you know, I'm I'm new to the area. If you ever have any anything you want to work on, anything any, any issues, then then give me a call. And I I got his business card, and so I kind of remembered that, and I said, you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna see if there's anything they can do to help help us out with this because yeah. I can't obviously their jurisdictions go to would be their jurisdiction yeah. is, is you know a huge area. So, again, long story short, we ended up working these guys together, him and I, one weekend. And sure enough, I mean, based on what we'd found, just watching them for like two days, these guys were taking some fish because they were, they were moving around. Of course, we were trying to watch them and, you know, stay hidden and all that stuff. So we were able to put together um, basically a task force with involved the feds, New Hampshire, Vermont, New York. Um, and we were able to, over two weekends, mostly one big weekend but two weekends we were able to observe them out there fishing we were we um, we had guys out on the ice that were wearing plain clothes that were that were pretending to be fishing that were you know keeping tallies on what they were catching we were able to follow them back to their hotel they were turns out they were taking the fish and they were hiding them in the snowbank outside of the hotel so when they left the the um to go back to go fishing a couple of the guys went to the hotel, dug up all the fish, brought them to a different location, spread them all out, took photographs of them all, counted them all, mm. um, and then put them back in the, in the, um, in the snowbank. They put them back there incorrectly. <laughs> we didn't know it at the time, but they actually, each guy had their own bag. They had their own color strings that they had on the bag. So oh they, they weren't working together. They were working kind of separately uh -huh. because it was all money. So yeah. each, you know, those are my fish. Those are my, those fish. Are my fish. That's my money. So yeah. we didn't realize at the time. And they actually, one of the guys witnessed them. They almost got into a fist fight over it because they thought they were cheating each other because <laughs> they're like, you took my bag, you took my fish. So then it was pretty funny. Um, actually, he got it on, he got it recorded, um, video recorded. But so so we ended up um, ultimately they had um, I think that weekend alone I forget what the numbers were but it was upwards of a thousand fish like Jeez. over the limit it was just crazy mm -hmm. and so we we did we ended up executing search warrants um, and arrest warrants for these guys and went back to the to, to New York and Vermont um, and interviewed these guys and they they admitted to doing this for years and they wow. said their best haul they ever had 
well, in one weekend, they needed a snowmobile trailer to haul the fish back because the truck wouldn't wouldn't hold all the fish. Oh my caught. goodness! So I mean, what a, snowmobile trailers are rated for thousands of pounds. So, oh yeah. So um, yeah, I mean, it was it was crazy. It was, yeah. uh, and they'd been doing it for years, and so they were just basically depleting the resources. They yeah, didn't, talk about they raping a resource. Yep, absolutely. Know? And uh, certainly taking it away from you know kids and everybody else. And uh, you know, I think initially that's why. I've, limits for panfish came in because people start commercial fishing it is so. yeah I, I i think it is um because up until that point it really wasn't an issue i mean because no. even the limits are pretty high i mean mm-hmm. you can, you can yeah, take a lot of fish, fish each, right, so right. i mean that's who that's needs quite more a bit. than that right? yeah so so but i can imagine when you're, you're you know that's when everything goes bad when you're making money on it so absolutely you know. I've, I've always said that from the beginning is you know when when there's money to be made when people are making money off the resources the resources suffer and yep. those are the ones that'll you know they'll Certainly continue that's to suffer. where we see you know in africa across the bear galls you name it absolutely and everything when i put you a dollar figure on a resource that's uh that's where we we start having serious serious problems so uh people taking advantage of it so no doubt so hey one of the coolest things that we do or the biggest crime i always think of uh, in fishing game is like night hunting and i know you've had some uh some good bouts with night hunters down there in your area and they're pretty active down there in that country because you got some good deer you got some good areas to night hunt and uh you certainly have some investigations uh hoping you could share some of those highlights with us yeah there's there's been a lot of good cases um pro- you know there's been too many to, to list or just, a, you know, a lot of that we could spend hours and hours and hours talking about them, which... Um, that gives me great, great podcasting material. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Um, but probably the best case that um, that, that I was ever involved with um, was some some guys that were known players. These guys had, had you know, wasn't their first rodeo. Um, several of the guys, or at least one or two of the guys had been arrested and convicted of night hunting previously, um, have, had been suspended, had, you know, these guys were just guys that were high on, on, you know, the profile list, um, mm-hmm. as far as guys that are, you know, out there committing these violations. And so we had got a call. It was actually a, a Saturday night. We were, we were kind of planning on working a, de- or a detail anyway that night. And some guy had called and said that, um, he was up in his tree stand and, um, he heard a, a shot. It was during the, the gun season, rifle season. And uh, it was really late. It was probably 10 or 15 minutes after legal shooting hours, which, you know, at that time of year, 10 or 15 minutes after legal, it's, it's dark. I mean, mm-hmm. it's not, it's not questionable. It's, oh, yeah. it's dark. Um, and that he had, he had, um, so we heard the shot and he, he had come out of his tree stand. I think he was kind of on his, on his way out or he was come, working his way out of the woods. So just, you know, everything kind of had, was the stars aligned. Everything was in our favor. He was kind of coming out of his stand. He knew a lot of the local people. And so he saw this truck um, that had pulled, was driving down the road. And he was, he was familiar with the truck. He knew, he knew whose truck it was. And uh, he had seen the guys, they, they were, they pulled into a driveway of a house um, and they were kind of doing something that kind of just looked sketchy. They were, they was, they'd kind of get out of the car or whatever. And so he kind of walked over to the, to the vehicle as it pulled out of that driveway and, and, uh, they stopped and he, he identified the driver. He knew who the guy was and he'd made a comment to him, something about being late or something like that, the shot. And they, he just, just guy basically said, mind your own business or whatever. So he, fortunately for us, you know, and a lot of people don't do this because of, they don't want that conflict. They don't want to kind of have their name used and they don't want people to know that they're ratting people out, yeah. which they're not rat, you know, they're, they're, they're doing what's right. Yeah. Um, but he called us, he called and reported it. And, um, so it, it ended up being a, a, a good case where there was, there was four guys that were impl- implemented in this that were were, char- were arrested for this and, and convicted of it. Um, basically, they were they were driving down the road, four guys in a vehicle, and it was well after dark. And the guy sees a deer in the field, and uh, and one of the guys gets out and shoots right from the road and, and shoots a deer. Um, and then they all kind of got out and and help drag it back and so they were all very much involved in this um and we ended up you know doing search warrants and and arrest warrants and and all that stuff and we got four convictions for for night hunting on it um and you know we got one of the guys i think the main the shooter he ended up pleading to like a a six-year license suspension and um you know it just ended up being a really really good case it took you know it took a lot of resources for us too like we called in you know a couple of guys from from uh from surrounding areas and so it ended up ended up being a really really good case and again they were all 
you know, very, very well known. Very, you know, these guys again. It wasn't. They weren't angels. They were. They were. Right. They'd done this They're many poachers. times, and they were poachers. And that's yeah. you know. And so um, we we arrested them all at the same time, interviewed them all at the same time, and it ended up working out really well because there was one of the guys that was kind of the weak link, you could say. So we went at him first, and he ended up rolling and giving us everything. And it it was it was quite a quite, it was quite a case. It was good. Yeah, no doubt. Um, you know. I, I don't think people understand how important it is to make those calls either. You know, uh, the Operation Game Thieves, the uh, turn into poacher programs nationwide. Uh, if you if you know that information, you just have to give it to us. We'll run with it. So, yeah, absolutely. Uh, you and uh, just so, so important. And I, I, I hear that all the time. I don't want to be a rat. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you, you're not a rat. You're doing the right thing. Yep. So, uh, yep. you know, it's just a mentality. I think people grow up with being a rat. But, you know, they're stealing. You they know? are. And, if someone went into my house and stole something, would you let? Would you tell anybody about it? Yep. You know, I, yep. you know, I, yep. I, I hope somebody would, but right. no. When it comes to fishing game right. stuff, they it, don't you seem know, to. It, and worse yet, I mean, I, yeah, they're they're definitely stealing, but I think it's it's they're 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 stealing something that that it needs to be around, or it hopefully will be around for generations and generations to come. And yeah, sir, if someone steal breaks into your house and steals your television. You know what? They'll be making more. They'll always right. make more. You can go down the they'll store and make get more whatever. One then. But once these resources are gone, they're gone. They're gone uh-huh. forever, and people don't don't understand that or don't appreciate that. And so if that's a mature deer, we're talking a year and a half, two right. years to exactly. reproduce that. Exactly. You kill one of those deer. How many deer deer are you really killing? If it's a, yeah. if it's a mature doe, how many how many yeah. deer are you killing? Yeah, but she's pregnant. Um, it's probably three. Absolutely. You know? Absolutely. So, um, you know, it's it's one of those things that you know. I wish more people. I think it's starting to become. I think with the television shows and, mm-hmm. um, and you know the the fact that people are kind of starting to realize that we're actually human beings and we're not we're not the bad guys. Right. Um, I think people are starting to call more. I mean, I'm I'm certainly getting more positive feedback and more people that are willing to report things um, than ever before. Um, so I hope that it's people are learning that that's, yeah, that's absolutely. Um, and maybe we're breaking know. down that culture of you know it's a rat. It's you know yeah, and, and absolutely that society. You know, to keep everything quiet, you know, so you don't turn in your neighbor. So uh, I know you've had some uh, pretty interesting uh, encounters, maybe with some alcohol and hunting. The milk and whiskey story. <laughs> oh, that's, yes. that's That's, that's, yes. that's uh, you know, we got we to gotta share that because uh, yes. yeah, that, that had me laughing for a little bit, too, in our pre-interview here. So, uh, yes. you yeah, know, yeah. certainly got to share that. So. And this is like turkey season, right? Yeah, it was it was turkey season. Um, it was it was one of those cases that um, it it just kind of all the stars aligned just just right at the right time, and it was lo- a lot a lot of it was luck. Um, so basically, we had Bill Boudreau and I had got a call. It was uh, I don't think it was opening day of turkey season, but it was very. He's a sidekick. You were Bill. <sighs> I'm usually in his truck because okay, of his so dog, so maybe I'm the sidekick. I don't know. Um, so yeah, so we got a call. The guy had had witnessed um, some people shoot um, on posted property, shoot a, a, a turkey on on posted mm-hmm. property. And they'd kind of snuck in from the backside, and and the guy, you know, had I think he'd seen him shoot it in the field, um, and then he kind of he was kind of angry about it, so he went around the, to the other side of the property and and saw a pickup truck, and he actually got. He didn't get a, a plate number on the truck, but he, he knew it was a New Hampshire plate. He knew it was, um, you know, a, a, a blue Chevy pickup truck or whatever it was. So so uh, we we ended up, we went there and uh, we got there pretty quick because we were pretty close to, to where it happened. So we got there within, you know, half an hour and uh, we talked to the guy and he kind of brought us back to where the, where the where the turkeys were shot or the turkey was shot. And, uh, of course, Bill had Ruby, so she, she ran, you know, he ran Ruby around. She found a shell, found a wad, I think. So, we're you know, we're putting kind of together a case, but we didn't we didn't really have, um, a, you know, a vehicle per se. We had a, a, a vehicle with a New Hampshire plate, which how many blue Chevy pickup trucks are there mm-hmm. with New Hampshire plates? A lot. Mm-hmm. So we, we dropped, we kind of, you know, we left this guy and we're, we're we pulled down to a spot on the side of the road, and and there was a couple other descriptive things that he had said about the truck. But um, we um, we're sitting there on the side of the road trying to figure out what we're going to do, where we're going to go with it. And there drives by this truck. It's it's kind of matching the description. It's blue. Um, it's blue. It's Chevy. You know, it's, it's a Chevy. And uh, so we well, well let's follow him. So we kind of we kind of follow him for a little bit. And um, they had done something um, to to basically enable us to, to make a stop. I mean, it mm-hmm. was some motor vehicle moving violation. So we stopped them um, for that violation, and um, they had a turkey in the back of their truck. 
it was an untagged turkey. There was, there was, there was no tag on the, on the turkey. So we started talking to them about the, you know, them hunting and, you know, why there's no tag on the turkey. And they said, oh, we're, we're going to bring it to the check station and tag it. And we're like, well, it doesn't really work that way. You have to tag the, the turkey when you kill it, and then you bring it to a check station. So we start kind of looking into the, to the, uh, to the turkey. And uh, right away I could smell one of the guys. This was probably 9.30 in the morning, you know. It was pretty early in the morning. Right, not the driver or driver? You no, know, the passenger. The passenger. Yeah. I could smell alcohol coming from the passenger. So... So as I'm talking to him a little bit, and you know, I'm, I'm just smelling this alcohol coming from him, and I said, "Well, how, how much have you had to drink today?" And he said, "Well, I've had a couple of whiskey drinks this morning when I when I get up." I said, "Well, what time did you get up?" He goes, well, "I got up about three o'clock, three thirty. I said, "You you had some whiskey drinks at three thirty in the morning when you got up?" And without skipping a beat, he said, "Well, we didn't have any milk." <laughs> so, um, I mean, I couldn't really condemn him on that one because it was yeah, just such when a you know that milk. What do you do? <laughs> you run out of milk. You drink you, whiskey. You have whiskey. Um, so we ended up making a really, really good case on that also. And it, and it turns out it wasn't, that wasn't the truck. That wasn't the truck that, that wasn't uh, the truck that, that shot the, on the posted property. So did you make the other case too? Uh, we did. Yeah, well, we did actually. Yep. We did. So you got lucky. We got the, lucky. With, with the whiskey rather than milk. Yep. Yep. Uh, yeah. They ended up bringing us to a fake kill site and then we ended up going to the real kill site and they shot from the road. Um, oh. and there was a bunch of other stuff with that too. So yeah, we ended up making the, the poster property case. And the 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 whiskey drinkers case too. My goodness, that, that was, was good. a good morning. That was a real good morning. Yeah, nothing like luck. So, but you got involved with some uh, pretty hairy cases too, as far as uh, some cold cases, working with state police. That uh, probably a near death experience for you. Well, yeah, it certainly could have been a near death experience. Um, it left yeah. me with a pounding headache. At the yeah. very least, um, yeah. It's so kinda crazy. Yeah. yeah, it is. So you know, like. A lot of our cases with search and rescue. I mean, when it comes to when it comes to some of these things, I mean, you know, they kind of look to us to to help. I mean, I mean, I'm sure you've worked some oh, some absolutely. cold case stuff yeah. that you know that involved maybe somebody something getting dumped on on in the woods or something yep, like lots that. Lots of searches. Um, so this was a case that I, you know I didn't have a ton of involvement with it from the word from the from the beginning, but a, apparently. Um, a mass it sounds like you were a grunt to begin with. Oh yeah, yeah. I was yeah. just I was the guy I was doing the grunt work. Yeah, um, which is you know nothing new. No, that's that's fine. I'm not opposed to that. Sometimes grunt works better. <laughs> Sometimes <laughs> ignorance is told. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, so yeah, this was a it was a mass state police case that that was from like the 70s, I think. Wow, and, that, that cold. Oh, it was cold. Yeah, oh. it was ice cold. Um, and so there was, there's some, there's some mines, there's some old mica mines and feldspar mines. I don't know if you've ever been up to the Groton mines. Yeah. It's, it's a pretty, it's a pretty big area. It's a pretty neat old place. But mm-hmm. so apparently this, this trooper had got Ruggles word. mines, I think. No, it? it's not. It's, it's not a, no, it's the, okay. um, P- Palermo mines. Palermo, so it's okay. kind of in that same area, but yeah. a, a little bit, you know, off there. But, mm. um, it's not a, it's not a well, you know, published populated place not, not many people know about it unless mm-hmm. you're you know unless you're from the area or whatever but anyway he'd so he'd got word they will now yeah they will yeah um i won't release <laughs> where it is but um he'd got word or they they thought that this girl was in the 70s was murdered and then brought up there because i think at the time you could drive right up there pretty easily uh-huh. and dumped into one of these like these vertical shaft um mines old feldspar mica mine and so by the time I got there, we had been involved in it, but I, I didn't have any involvement with it. But by the time I got there, they'd already, they'd, they'd figure out a way to, they were going to pump the water. So they'd filled up with water. Shafts were pretty deep. And they figured they were going to pump this, this, the shaft out and hopefully find some, some bones and kind of close this, this, uh, this cold case out. And, uh, so when I got there, they had a, a big, big, like six inch pump that they had gas pump that they had on this raft that was in the middle of this this mine it wasn't real big diameter or, or you know circumference around the mine but it was really really deep and so it was probably pumped down about 30 feet 40 feet by the time i got there and there was some kind of makeshift ladders they had set up so as the the pump was as the water was getting pumped out of it the the pump was lowering further and further into the shaft so what we were doing was we were kind of taking turns climbing down um into the shaft and then you know putting fuel in the in the gener in the pump and kind of checking the the oil on it and checking the the water depth see how far how much further we had we had a big giant stick we we're just poking down in there and so as the shaft kind of went down it was kind of undercut and it was like it started to be where it was where it was going down and there was kind of a roof forming over the 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 top of this this pump mm-hmm. and so it's internal combustion engine and and I didn't really think about it at the time 
And I, so it was my turn to go down there. So I went down there and right away I kind of started feeling dizzy, kind of started feeling weird, you know? So yeah. I'm like, huh, what, what the heck's going on? So didn't think a whole lot about it. And I'm down there and I'm fiddling with the thing. I'm putting gas in it. And it's, you know, taking me time to, to do all this. It's probably five, six, 10 minutes had passed, something like that. And, uh, so as I'm, as I'm doing this, I'm starting to feel real dizzy. Like things are starting to get like, I'm, I'm starting to like, feel like I'm going to pass out. I'm like, what? And what's going on? So I'm like, I got to get out of this thing. So I, I finished it up. I fired up the, the, the pump and, and, uh, started climbing up the ladder. And as I'm climbing up the ladder, like my vision is starting to close on me. Like I'm starting to feel like I'm going to pass out. Like, and I'm just trying to, I'm just trying with all I have to. And to usually just, when you think that, it's almost too late. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm thinking, and so I'm tied in, and I'm like, like the ladder is there's 70, 80 feet of ladder here, and I'm tied in, but not real well. I mean, it's not, right. it's not like a real professional job here. That we, you know, mm-hmm. we're kind of, we're kind of making this out of nothing, and uh, so I'm just trying my darndest not to pass out to climb this ladder. And as I get to the top, I kind of don't remember it because the, you know, it was one of those things where I kind of remember it, but I'm not sure if I remember it because people were telling me about it or if it was because I actually remember it. Well, I got to the top and everybody's and, – and Todd Bogardis was there and a bunch of guys and they're talking to me and I don't remember anything. I don't remember – I don't – I couldn't – I remember him talking and I couldn't understand what he was saying to me. I couldn't mm. like comprehend – what he was telling me and I, and I was able, they had to drag me up the rest of the, the rest of the way. And, um, and I, like I said, I never went unconscious, but I had a, just felt like I was going and then I had a hu- pounding headache and then, you know, everything ended up did, did working they all, out. Did they all figure it out really they, quickly? They figured out that it was carbon monoxide yeah. is what was happening. It was starting to build up and it's heavy, you know, I'm no right. scientist, but it was heavier than air. So it was just kind of settling yeah. down there and filling that shaft up with carbon monoxide. So, yeah, I mean, it wasn't good. No. no I, that. I think I killed a few brain cells, which I can't afford to lose. Yeah. I don't have yeah. many to start with. But. I always remember that passing out feeling as it gets darker and darker. And yeah, darker. it was and Usually closing when you figure in. it out, it's, it's too yep. late. So yep. you, were, you were very lucky. So um, that's, that's some incidents. uh you know, serving some search warrants where you had to be a little aggressive there? Well, it was actually an arrest warrant. An arrest yeah, warrant. Yeah, okay. it was an arrest warrant um, where, yeah, the guy, he... he uh, arrest warrants are better if you see the guy. Arrest warrants are great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Especially <laughs> when you have the warrant um, and the guy I was working... Arrest warrant and a search warrant. Search warrants take a lot of time and a lot of effort. Oh, arrest, yeah, arrest warrants are great. <laughs> Absolutely. Because you just go, you've got the warrant, you don't have to, no questions asked. Yeah. So I was with a Vermont guy. Um, and are you in Vermont again? No, it was in New Hampshire. Okay, great. Just <laughs> checking. Hampshire. And um, we, so we ended up pulling up. We we had a couple to serve, and it was uh, most of them. We were just kind of just summonsing the guy um, on the warrants, but you know, if because everybody would just come to the door and, and you know answer the door and you'd serve them with their with their warrant. I mean, it was just ultimately a summons. But mm-hmm. so this one guy, we pull up, and just as we pull up, he's he's stepping out of the door. I'm like, and I knew the guy, so I recognize him right away, and he sees us, and just turns tail and runs. So I bail out of the truck and go after him and he slams the door just as I'm getting to him. So I, you know, do a flying ninja kick and, uh, <laughs> kick the door open and, and end up tackling the guy. And, um, all said and done, he's angry that I broke his door down. I'm like, well, you shouldn't have run. He's like, well, the door was unlocked. So I wasn't going to turn the handle to find out. <laughs> you should have just, uh, just unlocked it. Yeah. You should have just stayed just right where you were. Door. Absolutely. Yeah. So you got involved with another warrant too, out of Maine, didn't you? Didn't you execute that? Was that when you were training, maybe? Which one? When you were in Maine. Didn't you do a Maine warrant, a moose warrant? Were you involved with that? No. 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 Okay. No. Well, I, I guess that that wasn't me. So, reading my notes here, and then they went haywire. So, yeah. Um, anything else you want to share? Well, um, I don't know. Am I, is there something that I'm supposed to be saying? Uh, no, I, the, the, we're, we're done with the notes, man. But yeah. I just, you know, like to leave this open for you, you know, and uh, is there something else? Uh, you want to share with everybody because uh, certainly, uh, you know, the, the mic's yours, the stories are yours, uh, oh, the experience is yours, and that's that's pretty awesome that you get to share it with all of us because, you know, there's nothing better than game warden stories, if you ask me. Even being a game warden, creating those stories, listening to your stories makes, uh, you know, gets gets my juices going because I, I like catching the bad guys, the poachers, and, uh, you know, that's that's what I love about this podcast, man, is I get, get to talk to you guys and get to hear your experiences and share mine as we go and uh Absolutely. you know that, that that's what i think is good so this is this is your podcast as much as it's mine so um you know uh tv star you yeah. know <laughs> yeah uh, did you ever think that was going to happen when you came to fishing game uh no never never, never. in years no yeah. no i never um 
I never dreamed of it. And, you know, in, in fact, like when the show first started in Maine, like I honestly didn't really think much of it as far mm-hmm. as like I'm thinking, you know, and, and again, I think um, not be, because of a lack of anything. I mean, we definitely, you know, our, what we do, New Hampshire, Maine, you know, any state in, in this country, probably in the world, what we do, I think is probably one of the most interesting jobs in the world, you know, yes. one of the best jobs in the world. I just... I didn't see how it would translate, you know what I mean? Like to, to television necessarily, mm-hmm. because, you know, let's face it, like what they show on television is a result of, in some cases, days and days of making Absolutely. it happen. You know, they make yeah. it all happen in 45 minutes <laughs> where that, that case that happens in 15 minutes on the show took, you know, days to put days. together. So, Absolutely. you know, not obviously not knowing how it works and not knowing how, um, the process works. I'm thinking, you know, how are you going to do that? Because, you know, there is plenty of cases where it happens very, very quickly, mm. um, where something goes um, from good to really bad very, very quickly. Um, but again, you know, thinking, uh, how are they going to make a show out of this? Yeah. It's just, it seems crazy, but they've, they've managed they, to do they it. They do a good job. They bridge everything together. And yeah, four days goes into, you know, like one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, like the, uh, the alligator case um, with us, with me and Bill, I mean that was a you know ten minute segment or whatever it was, and it literally mm-hmm. took us. That was a that was a two solid two day case. That was right. two days of us you know sitting on the house and trying to and trying to get as much information. So you know, and that was ten minutes. I think one of the guys told me um, that it takes like one of the camera guys said that it takes uh, like six days of working of ten hour days of filming to make one 40 minute episode or 45, yeah. 42 minute, whatever Crazy. it is episode. Those guys so, work very hard at it too. Oh, you they know? do. They got to keep up with us and they do. They get in some gnarly situations as well, just like we do. So you yeah. Know, search and rescue well, missions. I think, I think more so because like, you know, I had like one of the guys, Ken, he, this was a while back and, and, uh, you know, we first kind of started doing whatever and he was, he like tripped over something really ridiculous. I don't remember what it was, but it was something that like, why would he trip over that? And so um, I asked him, I said something about it. And then I got thinking about it. Like Ken's not watching where he's going. Ken's watching what we're doing. Right. So they're like how they don't kill themselves is beyond me. Like they, they're not paying attention that they put themselves at, at in harm's way. They put themselves yeah. at risk to get those shots of what we're doing. And I'm paying attention and I get to, to watch what I, you know where I'm going and all that stuff. Uh, absolutely, I remember so, looking back on top of Mount Washington and 65 miles an hour winds, and saying something to the camera guy as he's getting rolled around on, on the deck up there, and he's trying to hold the camera so it doesn't get destroyed. So yeah. he's like in his body wrapped around this camera because he doesn't want it to get destroyed, and he's he's getting tossed in the wind yep, and rolled they, away. Yeah. And they, they definitely <laughs> and I could do nothing but laugh. I yeah. was just you know just seeing the camera guy holding his camera getting rolled across the yep. top of Mount Washington, just, was, just trying to save that camera, just trying to save the yep. camera, and that that was his job, and he yep. did a heck of a job. But it was just I was just about to say this is really windy up here. I'm about <laughs> to lose my feet, and he did. So yeah, it's um, crazy. It's yeah, crazy. so they they get to see some cool experiences too. But, yep, uh, they do. Yeah. So and and sharing with everybody these stories, I think it's it's cool. It brings out the wildlife experiences and you know and uh, you know the law enforcement aspect, the search and rescue aspect. Uh, you know, it's a it's a really cool job, and uh, hopefully we can promote it to get other people into it. Yep. And, uh, absolutely. You know, uh, continue on. So, yep. but uh, no, thanks. I really appreciate the time hanging out with me. And yeah, uh, you're welcome. Yeah. So, and uh, thanks for listening to me. We'll, we'll have to make some gore stories come back. We'll chat. Yeah, so, absolutely. Yeah. Cool. Absolutely. Thanks, Eric. Thank you. Please join me, Game Warden Wayne Saunders, and other Game Wardens on our adventures protecting wildlife, saving lives, and having fun all while serving the public and the natural resources of our planet. Listen to the tales and experiences of those who work in the outdoors while being entertained with stories about encounters with poachers, wildlife investigation, murder investigation, near-death experiences, search and rescue missions, wildlife interactions from game wardens around the country and around the world. When I retired, I realized I couldn't let go of that legacy, but rather wanted to share the passion, the commitment, and the stories of those men and women that call themselves Game Wardens. This is Game Warden, Wayne Saunders, and this is Warden's Watch.